Three common behavior problems, understanding them and addressing them. Written by me and narrated by me, William Garrido. So I made a, a video, basically a slideshow presentation on common behavior problems. And it's very comprehensive. It's, it's, a, it's like a 20 something minute long video with bullet points. And that is only accessible through the Facebook a membership area, which I have at the moment, depending on when you're watching this or when you're listening to this. I may have it available right now. Um, or if you're listening to this 10 years from now, it may or may not be. We'll see. Okay, so again, three common behavior problems, understanding them and addressing them. This is the PDF version of that. Why this will change the way you look at your dog. Let's get right to the point. Understanding your dog a little bit more will give you a new perspective on why your dog does what it does. As we dive into this topic, I want you to observe your dog's behavior problems from their perspective. Why do you think it does what it does? If you were your dog, why would you do the behaviors your dog does? What goes in what goes on in your life from morning to nighttime? What are you eating? What events are taking place during the day when the behavior problems aren't taking place? The truth is most dog owners don't ever take the time to assess the entire scope of their dog's behavior. Most dog trainers also lack the perspective and operate primarily from a human point of view. This leads to several blind spots and supposed trivial information unaccounted for. So why does your dog, or any dog for that matter, does what it does? Who am I and why listen to me? My name is William Garrido and I have, been, uh, I have authored several books on the topic of dog training. I also taught at a school for dog trainers as a head instructor for several years. I've worked with police and service dogs for the disabled. I currently work with pet owners, helping them achieve their goals and helping them address problems and misunderstandings with their four-legged companions. I understand dogs and dog behavior because I've made it my career to do so. This guide is meant to help you get a glimpse into what I normally see. As a dog owner of six dogs myself, at the moment, a Chihuahua, uh, four Malinois, a Catahoula, uh, I can tell you with absolute certainty that every behavior my dogs engage in have very practical applications, regardless of how inconvenient at times they are. So a little bit more about myself. You may or may not follow me. I've been working with dogs at, as of this recording for like 14 years now. I have uh, worked with contract working dogs in Afghanistan. I was a trainer there. So I, I worked with dogs that were trained and continue to train in the search of explosives, narcotics, protection work. Uh, the majority of my background, the beginning of my career was actually in protection work and police work. Then I like I mentioned a moment ago, I work with service dogs and just a bunch of different things. I've gone to several seminars, several um, schools, and that's basically a little bit more about me. All right, let's get back to the book. And now the next section, what is a behavior problem? A behavior problem is simply a behavior. That's it. It's neither good nor bad in the eyes of the dog, but rather a practical behavior at the moment. So why the labels? Because we're human and we like to categorize things so we can understand them. It makes sense to us, of course, but it doesn't serve our cause. They're only problems because we deem them to be problems. In essence, what I'm trying to say is that from your dog's perspective, every behavior has a perfect practical meaning. A dog lunging at another dog is a practical behavior at that particular moment. 
a dog barking at the window as people go by is by all means a practical behavior at that particular moment. Regardless of whether you deem them problematic or not, they serve a very practical purpose. Looking into your dog's daily routine as well as yours, are there moments or behaviors or interactions you would deem irrelevant or unrelated to your dog's, uh, you know, quote-unquote problems? Think back on those moments and you will see many of these unrelated or irrelevant and trivial details often contribute to the outbursts or problems we see in our dogs. There is one common behavior problem, aggression, whether it's dog or human aggression. Okay, first of all, what is aggression? It is simply an act of violence towards another. Different dictionaries and publications have slightly differently worded version of that, but they all essentially say the same thing, which is an act of violence towards another. Essentially, that's what they all say. Okay, there they might be worded differently, but that's the essence of aggression. So why does your dog engage in aggressive responses? Why does it feel the best strategy to improve its situation is an act of violence towards another dog or person? Is it trying to communicate, you're too close, don't touch me? The last time I saw you, I had a bad experience. Or is it more like I am bored and I do very little all day, so I want to express my frustration on you? Do you see how one behavior display can have more than one motive? The reality of the matter is that most dog owners don't consider the possible reasons their dogs act this way. Unfortunately, the same can be said for a lot of dog trainers. Aggression is the surface symptom in many cases. If we are to address it, it would be important to try to understand what is motivating the dog to act in violence. Award on aggression. Many well-meaning dog trainers and pet owners have gotten into the habit of softening the sound of aggression by relabeling it as reactivity. It is important to know that reactivity is a recent label and it's really mostly made up by dog trainers, okay? Not not by behaviorists. It's not a language that was that was um, that was there for for a while. If you read books on animal behavior on on ethology you're not going to really see the word reactivity. You're going to see the word aggression. Okay, but back to the book. It's important to know that reactivity is a recent label. It's used to describe a dog on a leash lashing out at another dog, whether the the lashing out is frustration or full-out aggression display. It doesn't seem to matter to the person using the term. Okay, I would like to assume that we can distinguish between a dog pulling and maybe being a little bit frustrated and a dog pulling, okay, snarling, showing teeth and growling or barking, okay? The latter is a clear display of aggression. And that's what usually people will say, oh, he's being reactive. No, call it what it is. It is aggression, okay? We don't help our situation by downplaying the behavior and calling it reactivity. Because aggression can have many different motives, it is the owner's best in the owner's best interest to contact a professional with experience in this type of behavior. A solution for one form of aggression can be counterproductive and a waste of money and time for a different type of aggression. That's how vastly different the motivations can be. The one thing we can all be in agreement with is that a great antidote for aggression is obedience. Obedience training is one of those things that can be applied to all forms of aggression and other behavior problems. Sure, there may need to be additional steps to take in order to address the situation. That's that's always a good idea. But obedience training, good obedience training that is, can be a great way to manage and address 
aggression. For example, a dog that truly understands the heal command and is taught to perform it under any circumstances should only perform the heal command when faced with a trigger. I've been able to help dog owners with very aggressive dogs by simply teaching them how to perform obedience under any distractions. Now I'm going to deviate from this section of the of the of the book here and add a little bit more of my um, a little bit more of my experience than I could fit into this. Okay, aggression is a very broad topic. I have videos and several episodes on the topic of aggression. That's how complex it can be. So this is not to to be the entire scope of aggression, okay, this section that I just went over. But I do want to add a couple of things. Okay, obedience training typically works great because, look, if a dog is lashing out at other dogs, whatever the, the motive might be, a lot of times it's genuine frustration. The dog just doesn't have a whole lot going on, and it's a very young, impulsive dog typically that will do this. Okay, they're just they they just want so much more activity that they can usually get, but they're not mentally and physically motivated enough. So they see dogs and then they lash out. Whatever the reason might be, whether it's that or whether it's genetic, meaning that they were really uh, wired to be aggressive, like some dogs are. Okay, it's very common for for uh, this is this has been my experience. I don't know if if it has been everybody's experience. I can tell you from a personal experience, a lot of the dog aggressive dogs that I see happen to be show line German Shepherds, okay, or black and tan German Shepherds. That's the primary suspect. Whenever I hear somebody tell me uh, they have a German Shepherd, and this this might be coincidence, but it's not really. Other people have experienced this as well. I'm not the only one making this up. When I see working line German Shepherds, they're hardly aggressive at all. And if you're not sure what working line, show line is, look it up. That doesn't mean, please, that does not mean go get a working line German Shepherd, okay? That does not mean that. But it does mean that there is a pattern, okay? The aggressive dogs that I see a lot, the ones I'm consistently having to help, are usually the German Shepherds and primarily like the the black and tan, the show line shepherds, the the working line shepherds, different variations. They're normally not aggressive. Now, some of course are, but in the grand scheme of things, that's a pattern I see. What I'm getting at here is that it is genetic. Sometimes it is just that way. They just they don't even understand that they just see another dog and they're like, oh my god, I just have to chase that and I have to nip it. That's kind of how they feel. So whatever the motive is, I don't want to get too much off track, but whatever the motive is, obedience happens to work great because we can teach the dog, look, healing means healing. Okay, when I call you, that means you come back to me. They cannot do that and lunch at the other dog at the same time. It is impossible. So by telling them you need to do this instead, That's obedience, okay? That's a great way to manage that and go, no, you're doing this. I'm not making you do it. You have to do it because you understand it. And then it also needs to be a sense of discipline. That's not something I went into in this lecture and in this book, but it's another another thing I wanted to add. Sense of discipline, okay? Just because a dog understands obedience very well, that's step one. We'll have to make sure that they understand what heal is. Once they understand it, and we know they do, the next step is you have to do it when you don't want to do it. And sometimes they're going to go, no, I don't want to heal. I want to go chase that dog instead. Boom, there needs to be a consequence. And you go, I know you understand it, but but I need to know the dog understands it, okay? If the dog does not understand heal, the dog doesn't know how to heal. How do we know if that's the case? Walk with your dog off leash, Drop the leash, okay? I'm not I'm not saying just have your dog off leash, but just try this in an area where it wouldn't be a hazard to you, to your dog or anybody else. And just say heal one time and start walking. Don't tap your leg. Don't say heal more than once. Don't, you know, don't snap your fingers. Don't act like you're luring or fake luring your dog. 
what does your dog do? If your dog starts veering away, okay, or even slightly getting away, and you find yourself, you healing to your dog, you keeping up with their pace so that it looks like you're healing, your dog does not know how to heal. Your dog should, should do it when you say it one time, regardless of which direction you go to, how fast, how slow you go, they should heal to you without you having to constantly snap your fingers, constantly tap on your leg. They should understand this. If they don't understand that, you need to first teach them what that is. Once you've taught them what that is and they understand it, then, then you, need to, you need to put in that sense of discipline, that sense of duty, which means you're doing it when you don't want to do it. Back to the, you know, back to the book here. Fearful and anxious behavior. That's another behavior problem that is pretty common. Another common complaint with today's dog owners is fearful or anxious behavior. Here, the behavior can range from panting and pacing to constantly trying to escape different situations. It's important to know that it's normal for any animal to find certain situations uncomfortable. If you are relaxing on your couch at night, enjoying a TV show, and suddenly you hear someone banging at your door, okay, jiggling the doorknob, or just messing with the doorknob, you will rightfully respond in a fearful or anxious manner. It's not your norm. It's unfamiliar and it's sudden change of, in your day. Many people have similar responses to talking to a person or making eye contact or talking in front of a group of people. While many don't find some of these situations anxiety or fear-inducing, some do. Dogs are the same way. They all have different situations they find out of the norm, unfamiliar or unpleasant. Just because you're afraid of you're afraid of talking to a group of people and that, that scares the hell out of you doesn't mean that I am. Just because I'm afraid of something that really terrifies me, it doesn't mean that you are. So we have different fears and so do dogs. Dogs have different things that, makes, that make them uncomfortable. Here's the reality. A cautious and fearful animal is actually a successful specimen. If you look at most animals, you'll see the majority of them aren't friendly, but rather quite shy, timid, and will avoid most situations out of the norm at all costs. This is the, uh, the trait of a successful animal. Okay, look at deer, look at raccoons, birds, okay, and even many domestic animals. You will see that our daily routine would induce fear and anxiety on most of them. So if if you see a deer, if you see a deer on the road and you want to get close to say hi to them, most of them will take off. Same thing with the majority of animals that you see out there. Most of them will not just be friendly and come up to you and tell you, "Hey, go ahead and pet me." They will ter- be terrified and they'll take off. Right? This is what I'm talking about, this is the trait of a successful specimen. If animals were just naturally friendly, imagine if deer were naturally friendly, right? Most of these animals were natural, fr- naturally friendly and came up to people. They would not be successful. They would die. So this is actually quite a normal mechanism for animals, for them to be cautious, for them to be afraid of things that are not the norm for them. So it's not out of this world to see a dog that is fearful of people, okay? Fearful of people getting too close to their space. Um, Dogs that don't do well with you, taking them to a new place, etc. So why do our dogs get fearful and anxious? Assess what is triggering your dog's anxiety and see if their fears are reasonable. Not according to you, but according to them. Look at it from their perspective. Now, again, to deviate a bit, what do I mean by reasonable? If your dog is, if you take your dog to a haunted house in Halloween and and your dog starts freaking the hell out, that's reasonable. If you take your dog to 
to to an, any place where there is something it has never seen before, and it's it's loud and it's big and it's making a lot of motion. Okay, it is reasonable for most dogs to be afraid of that. It's not their norm. They, they they've never seen something like that, and it is reasonable for any animal to see something they've never seen before and go, "I don't like that. That makes me uncomfortable." So that's what I mean by that. Okay. See if their fears are reasonable. What do I mean by uh, now unreasonable? If they're unreasonable, then I know, okay, maybe my dog is just constantly uh, constantly nervous. Okay, maybe there's more to it than that. Okay, what do I mean by unreasonable? So if your dog is kind of nervous of something it sees on a regular basis, uh, or if your dog is constantly timid and very anxious, about something that it's not even startling. It is part of their norm, but they just can't get past it. Now you might have other, you know, you might have to look at a dog. You might be looking at a dog that is displaying a unreasonable fear response to something that, that is fairly normal. Another very important factor for many pet owners that they overlook either they overlook or they aren't aware of, is that fearful behavior can be a temperament trait, okay, part of their personality. This may be due to early imprinting experiences when they were very young. Or as is more often the case, a genetic trait, okay? It could be just a genetic trait. Most pet owners think they're fearful or anxious dogs were abused. And the truth is that most dogs were not abused. Sure, many dogs get neglected, but that's not the same as abuse, okay? Abuse is an intentional, emotional, physical torture, so to speak. That's abuse. Like, abuse is when the person is purposely, very intentionally, going out of his way or out of her way to cause intentional, emotional, and physical damage to the animal. That's abuse. Neglect is not abuse. Yes, most dogs that end up on the shelters, a lot of them were neglected. But the, the number of dogs that were actually abused, it's very small. Yet everybody you talk to that has a fearful dog that they adopted, they go, oh, he or she was abused. And most often than not, guys, that's not the case. Okay? There are dogs that I have known that have actually been abused. Okay? That that were actually abused. They were, they were physically abused. And their personalities never flinched. They never became fearful or anxious when they should have because they were actually abused. But why did they did the personality never change? The temperament never got affected because it was their temperament. Their temperament didn't allow for these bad experiences to change their personality, their temperament, or their genetic trait. Okay? So temperament or genetic traits, which can be different, by the way. Okay? That, that's a topic that I go into more deeply in another lecture. But... The temperament or the genetic trait just did not allow for these bad experiences to make this dog fearful or anxious. That's just to give you an idea of how strong the personality can be. So that might be the case. How do you address this? How do you address fearful or anxious behavior? You have to make their out of the norm their norm. Expose them to it in the most gradual way possible. A non-gradual process can be effective as well, but it requires the eyes and supervision of a qualified person with experience. I've personally also noticed that fearful and anxious dogs often get coddled. This is a normal response by a person who wants to reassure and protect their dog, of course, but it often leads to perpetuating the anxious and fearful behavior. The problem with this 
is that it prevents the adaptation process necessary to toughen up the dog. So if you coddle the dog, okay, if this is what most people do. Most people coddle the fearful dog, and all it does is it prevents the adaptation process. Okay, the dog just gets softer and softer. The way that I have successfully approached the training of fearful dogs is by not treating them like fearful dogs at all. If they are uncomfortable with a certain stimulus, I don't shield them from that stimulus. I expose them to the stimulus they aren't particularly fond of. This allows the dog to do what they know how to do best, adapt. Once adaptation takes place, they're either less bothered or completely over the thing that made them afraid. And again, stepping away from this for a moment, that's exactly what happens. The soft, soft dogs get coddled the most. They come to me. I don't coddle them. I treat them like like dogs. I'm like, dude, you're not you're not gonna get shielded from the world. You're not gonna get shielded from the things that make you uncomfortable. I have more faith in you than that. I have more faith in you than your owners do. We're gonna do this thing that terrifies you. Okay, within reason, obviously. But we're gonna do these things. We're not gonna we're not gonna shield you from them. You're going to face your fears. And by doing it over and over in a nice manner, of course, I'm not saying throw them to the wolves, but by doing it again and again and again, you see that at first they're terrified, then they start to adapt, and then once they adapt, some of them even completely get over and they go, I have no idea why I was afraid of this. I could have faced this a long time ago and I would have been fine. So that works really well with fearful or anxious dogs third common behavior problem which is overexcitability or lack of boundaries okay overexcitability or lack of boundaries which a lot of times they're two and two in the same if i were to count all the dogs that i've ever worked with i would probably be able to determine that the majority of them came to me because of this particular problem Dogs don't normally come to this world with a sense of boundaries. They will push, pull, jump, nip, and get in your face if there are no clear boundary lines drawn. The level of overexcitability and pushiness in dogs can also be a temperament trait. Some dogs are overly friendly and confident, and when boundaries aren't made clear, these guys will show you and everyone how up and close they want to be how confident they are bouncing off of you and off your walls and furniture. Some are naturally more reserved and even a bit timid. However, even these dogs can become pushy. Not having a set routine or order of things will leave your dogs up to determine their own routine, their own order of things, and even their own hierarchy. Regardless of how much a dog loves you, not treating your dog like a dog, but treating it like a little child instead, can encourage pushing behavior. How do you address this? Have a set of rules. Stick to them. Mean what you say. Hold them to a high standard. Okay, if you need help with this, you definitely need assistance from a professional. Simply put, why do dogs get pushy? Because more often than not, we allow them to. This is a very common one, super, super common one. And it's usually the result of owners being very, very permitting with their dogs. They they don't have boundary lines, but it's the easiest to address. It's so, so easy to address. But a lot of people have a problem with it because it's something that people are not inherently, um, they're not inherently good at this, at drawing boundary lines. Okay, so now... That's the three common behavior problems. Uh, Obviously, there is more detail in all of them, but I wanted to condense them and basically show you why they happen. But there is another one that I'm going to be going over here in a moment, and it's pathological behavior. This is not common, okay? But it's something that sometimes you will see as a trainer, 
as a pet owner, hopefully you never have to deal with this. This is not a common problem per se, but it is something that you do see on occasion. This is not something you're likely to determine yourself, but you can get some hints that may be indicators of pathological behavior. Pathological behavior is usually the result of hormonal uh, or chemical imbalance. It could also be the result of some sort of brain abnormality. The symptoms are usually erratic behavior that is very unpredictable. This is something that usually takes a trained eye to help you determine. It's been my experience that many dog owners think their dogs are unpredictable, but in fact, they're quite predictable. It's just that the owners aren't fully aware of what they're looking at. Okay, so most people will think, oh, that's my dog. My dog has erratic behavior. Now, more, more than likely, you're just missing hints. You're missing the whole picture. When I evaluate these dogs, I'm like, okay, it's not erratic. It's not unpredictable. It's quite predictable. This is just what's happening. But in the case in which it is erratic, truly erratic, and it is entirely unpredictable, I'll give you a couple of examples here in a moment, that's when you go, this is not right. Diagnosing pathological behavior can only be done by a veterinarian. As a dog trainer, sure, I may be able to spot pathological behavior. I may be able to name it. I could, you know, call it that. But I would be unable to precisely diagnose the chemical and the hormonal imbalance or the brain abnormality, okay? This is where you have to do blood tests. You have to do scans, Usually, this you know once once you spot the the erratic behavior, once you spot the pathological behavior, and you go, "Wow, this is completely out of the norm." Okay, then you get confirmation from your veterinarian that tells you, "Yes, this is usually uh, the case." It's been my experience. The veterinarian will do the blood work, the scans, and they'll they'll confirm there is something wrong with your dogs. Uh, brain or there is something wrong in their in their chemistry that is causing this very erratic behavior so that's how it it typically happens but as a trainer i can't diagnose i can't tell you yes your dog has this chemical imbalance or anything like that i may have ideas i may have um i may have uh, a pretty good uh pretty good indication that that's what's happening i might be able to tell you this is more than likely what is taking place but I can't tell you your dog has a hormonal, a hormonal imbalance or a chemical imbalance or a brain abnormality. Okay, that at the times that I have seen these behaviors, it was truly unpredictable and it came in the form of pathological aggression. I mean, a dog that is resting one moment and the next moment they're leaping at the nearest person or dog in full aggression mode. Even if the person or dog is just sitting on the couch and not even looking at the aggressor, the very next moment after that unprovoked lash out, the dog is back to being a sweet dog. It's very drastic, unpredictable, and does not fit logical sequence. So that's an example I, I gave in the, in the book. And it was of this particular dog. To give you more detail on that example, it was a Rottweiler that would just be sitting, hanging out. It would be just chilling, minding its own business, maybe scratching. And you could see the eyes suddenly changing. The whole body, the whole demeanor completely changed. It was like it was, it looked like it was getting possessed. And suddenly sitting, hanging out, it would slow down a little bit. And as it was slowing down, you could see the transformation taking place. Boom, full aggression mode, unprovoked at anybody. You could not even be looking at, at, at her, and she would just, like, lash out. Yeah, it was a female. I remember her now. Just lash out and bite anybody. And then shortly after that outburst, it was like the demon was going away, and now it was the dog back to normal, being sweet again. That is very erratic, drastic change in behavior. That is something where if you see that, you talk to the owners, 
the owners describe this very specific event. And as you observe it, you go, this doesn't follow a logical sequence. There is no logic here. This is when be the behavior is not normal. It's not even abnormal. It's just straight pathological. It doesn't make any sense. Okay, the aggression would make sense if it was laying on the couch and somebody was poking it. If you were poking it and the dog lashed out at you, the dog would be right to do so. That follows a logical sequence. If the dog was on the couch and you were petting it, okay, that's still logical. It's it's a little bit uh, abnormal, right? You we could even say that's unprovoked, but it's not really unprovoked on the dog's from the dog's perspective. The dog might just be like, "Hey, I'm sitting." I'm trying to rest, and you're petting me. That's bothering me. And yes, we could say that that's really, you know, that was uncalled for. But it follows a logical sequence. If the dog was laying and you were staring at it, and the dog lashed out, lashed out at you, yes, you could say that's, that's, you know, that's a little bit too much. But it follows a logical sequence. You were staring at the dog. You were m making eye contact. Dog might have felt threatened, whether you like it or not. Yes, it might be something that we want to work on, but it is not fully unprovoked. It follows a logical sequence. But if you're not doing any of those things, and the dog suddenly goes from sweet to insane aggressive, back to being sweet, you see there is no logical sequence here. Okay, another another example. Uh, of this was with somebody I know, same thing. Uh, her dog was was nice, right? Super nice dog with her. And then it would just get these fits of rage where it would start biting her badly, okay? Badly. And then it would come back to being a normal dog. Not provoked. Okay, this, this I, I knew this dog. And I could tell you, that there would be no particular issues with this person, with the owner. The owner loved the dog, like loved it. Okay, and in both of these cases, when examined farther, okay, in a medical manner with tests, scans, in both of these instances, there was a problem with uh, brain abnormality or, or blood chemistry abnormality that was causing this, this problem. Now, how do we address this? As a trainer, I would not be able to address this. This is now erratic pathological behavior. This is now something where the, the veterinarian will be able to help you manage the, the, um, the chemical imbalance, the hormonal imbalance, or the brain abnormality. Now, this is just pure medical. Okay, and in one of these instances, the veterinarian, they they did all they could, um, but eventually it turned it, it turned to look, it's gonna keep happening. And the one dog was too big and too powerful for this to keep happening with the owner that was much much smaller. This is not a training problem. Okay, this is not a oh there are no bad dogs, um, BS line. It's not that. It's truly, this was not uh, sustainable. This would get somebody hurt really bad. So the owner had to make that very hard decision to not risk that because there was there was no way to address this in a way that would be, okay, we've we're, we're fixed it. No, it would be more like we're managing it and it will still happen. We're just hoping it doesn't happen as often. If the dog was smaller, yes, that could be manageable. But if, with this very powerful dog that weighed over 80 pounds, uh, closer to the 90-pound range with this very small owner, that is unacceptable. And then the decision that had to be made was made, which I fully agree with. Okay, so that's what I mean by pathological behavior. It's not very common, but it does happen. Okay, and most people will go, oh, yeah, that's my dog. More than likely, it is not your dog. More than likely, you're doing something that is triggering the aggression. Something in the environment is triggering these behaviors. But a small minority of 
instances this does happen. And I've also been aware of other behaviors, uh, other pathological behaviors, where the end result was medical examination, which confirmed a brain abnormality like tumors or chemical abnormalities. Okay, one thing I've also seen is in some small cases, instances of neutering a dog or spaying a dog, this is not the majority of times, but in some instances when this happens, that does cause some erratic, some pathological behavior because now there is a huge hormonal imbalance, which dogs now, the majority of dogs do pretty well with, but every once in a while there are going to be some that just become extremely erratic due to the hormonal imbalance that neutering and spaying cause the animal. All right, now the last chapter of the book is understanding your dog. In closing, it's important to remember that dogs are still animals. Unfortunately, we tend to hold dogs to ridiculously high standards. No one gets too upset when a cat acts temperamentally, when a horse nips or throws you off. But for some reason, we expect our dogs to behave perfectly. We even hold dogs to a higher standard than our relatives and friends. Next time your dog behaves in a way you don't understand or appreciate, remember they're just dogs. Chances are you would forgive a friend if they disappointed you or upset you. And this is the truth. I know most people who have cats, they even laugh about the fact that their cats are assholes, right? Their cats will do things. Most people have that have any sort of other animal, they'll go, oh, yeah, you know, this this horse did this. He's a biter. Or he'll, you know, he'll occasionally kick you. Sometimes he'll buck you off, right? Um, or, oh, yeah, this goat is an asshole, right? They'll say things like that. But their dogs, for some reason, they have to be perfect. And see how how unfair that standard is for our dogs. We we don't hold them to the same standard as any other animal. We expect them to be perfect little angels. And that's when we think, oh, there is something wrong with my dog. Oh, my dog needs need, needs a lot of training. Oh, my dog needs uh, in, in, my dog needs medication. No, your dog is an animal. You need to lower your standards and realize that you shouldn't hold your dog to a higher standard than your friend or your relative or any other animal you've ever owned, you have to re- realize that they're going to do things that sometimes you're not going to appreciate. That's what they do. 